Um, just want to welcome everybody and thank you for coming out. Uh, I had gotten contacted by the Jim Thorpe Borough and looking for some information on, on a blight seminar. So I want to thank uh, Maureen Sterner and the Jim Thorpe Borough for allowing us to, to use the facility here at Memorial Hall today. Thank you. I also want to uh, introduce Marlon Kistner uh, from the Carbon County Chamber and Economic Development Corporation and thank Marlon uh, and the Chamber for being our sponsor today for the luncheon. I think we're having lobster tail and steak and shrimp. <laughs> Hold up on our budget. We're going to have hot dogs. Actually, that's what Doyle wanted. He wanted hot dogs, but we're doing a step up. We're going to have some sandwiches for sure. So thank you so much, Doyle, and uh, thank you for being here today. We are delighted to, um, to co-sponsor because we know firsthand all of us are on our little uh, streets in the downtowns, and we see um, what uh, needs to happen, and uh, we're just excited to be able uh, again, to partner and bring uh, some really great professionals here uh, to really help our county. And, you know, one of the things we say constantly is, and it really does work, the power of partnerships is how things happen. And I see so many familiar faces. We're all in this together, and I'm just so grateful. Um, yesterday, we were at the nonprofit forum with Amber and the Community Foundation, and we had so much great feedback. And, and one of the things that someone said was, listen, I work in a lot of different counties, and I do not see people come together like I do in Carbon County, and it made so many of us feel really great. So again, have a great, great seminar today. We do have applications available. Alice has them um, in the back, and our Main Street Lehigh Valley grant is out there, and I know that many of you have applied for it. In the past five years, Carbon County has received over $30,000 in this grant, and that is for welcome signs, planters, um, all kinds of great things to really help. I know it's, it doesn't cover the complete blight of our storefronts at times, but it does help our little towns. So that grant is available. It's a $2,000 grant with a $2,000 match, and that can be an in-kind match as well, which is great. So that is available through our office, and I think the deadline is May 31st. So make sure that you get a hold of that. We can help you with the application, help you with the process if needed. So I just want to thank um, Doyle. Thank you so much for having this. Um, have a great day, and you definitely know where to find the chamber. Thank you. And I, I also want to introduce uh, a couple of our uh, dignitaries that are here today. I'd like to introduce the, uh, Representative Jerry Knowles from the 124th, which encompasses uh, what Schuylkill, Berks, and part of Carbon County. Thank you, Jerry, for coming out today. Would you like to say anything? Real quick. Quick. There you go. No, I, I am certainly happy to be here. And uh, when it comes to the problem with blight, when you look at these two front tables, uh, these are the folks who know the most about dealing with this uh, particular problem. I thank you all for coming and uh, being a part of the program. And I want to uh, I want to congratulate uh, Senator Argel as well as Representative Hefley because when when you go to Harrisburg, you know you, you kind of get a niche in things that you really focus in on and and uh, want, have a little bit more interest in. And I commend Dave and Doyle for the work that they're doing in Harrisburg for you and for all of us. And uh, lastly, I want to thank you folks for coming out and showing the interest that you have in this particular issue. So Doyle, thank you for inviting me, and uh, I look forward to a good discussion. I also want, want to introduce uh, Representative Kurt Mosser from Northumberland County. Uh, Kurt uh, sits alongside me on the House floor, and he represents Knobles Grove, which I'm sure almost everybody in this room has been, been to. Uh, but Kurt uh, actually was uh, very helpful in putting this event together. I had modeled this event after the event that Kurt had done in his district. So if it doesn't go right, we're going to blame Kurt. <laughs> I also want to recognize Billy Richards from Senator John Udicek's office for being here today. Thank you. Uh, and Senator Udicek and I work together very close, uh, and John is a, a true partner in everything that we do here in Carbon County. Um, I want to uh, real quick, and I go down the uh, the list here of all the panelists. Uh, uh, Harold Pudline, the chairman of the board of Carbon County Redevelopment Authority. Rick Villello, Pennsylvania DCD deputy secretary for Community Affairs and Development. Andrew Sheaf, Pennsylvania DCD local government policy manager. 
Ed Cristianato, Housing Authority of Northumberland County, Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Housing Development Corporation of Northumberland County. On that side, there we go. <laughs> and uh, also uh, uh, Kathy Henderson uh, from the Carbon County Chamber. And I just want to uh, turn it over to Representative, or I'm sorry, Senator, former Representative, uh, State Senator Dave Argo, who. <laughs> who chairs the uh, uh, Blight Caucus uh, in, uh, in, in Harrisburg and just really has, has been a true leader across the state on this issue. Uh, Duell, I want to thank you for, for pulling this all together because events like this really do make a difference. Uh, it wasn't, I don't know how many years ago, uh, Kurt, did, did you and I do this up in, in your district with Senator Gordner? And I've seen a lot of good things happen in, in your communities uh, since then. Uh, you know, the, the key is, and, and the, the, the chamber noted it this morning, getting people to, to work together. And I, I just want to talk to you for a minute as a neighbor, not with any of my miscellaneous uh, titles. But, you know, I spend a lot of time in Carbon County visiting my mom, uh, you know, eating in your restaurants and uh, shopping in your stores. As, as I've told Doyle many times, from my house on my bicycle, I can be in Carbon County in about five minutes. Uh, when I'm rowing my boat, it takes me a little bit longer or, or walking the dogs. Uh, but I spend a lot of time here. And, and I've seen it over, over the years. Some of your communities have made amazing progress. Some have moved in the opposite direction. And that's not unusual. I think that that's probably true for, for every, every county in, in Pennsylvania. Now, what, what causes blight uh, at a meeting like this uh, when I was still in the House? I remember one of my, my colleagues from the lower end of Bucks County had said, look, you go to any community in Pennsylvania that's faced some economic distress, you're going to see blight. You know, when the, the big garment factory closes or when the steel mill closes or when the coal mine closes. Sounds a little bit like Carbon in Schuylkill County, right? And so I, it's not a, an accident that, that these things have happened. The, uh, the house that I grew up in in Tamaqua on the east end of town, half a double, built during the First World War. And I wondered one time, why wasn't there a street behind Arlington Street? And then I realized that, well, that's when the anthracite coal business hit its peak in 1917. So the town stopped growing. Today, we're at 2% of our peak production year in 1917. And so we're talking about a long, painful decline, the loss of tens of thousands of jobs. Uh, one of our colleagues was once talking about, you know, 25% unemployment in the 1950s. And I thought, oh, that can't be right. I looked it up. He was off by 2%. It was 27%. So think about that. One out of every four people, uh, you know, that was looking for, for work in, in coal mining towns in Carbon and Schuylkill County couldn't find it. And so when I, I taught my class at LTRIC Tamaqua a couple of summers ago, and one of the students said, well, what happened? I said, well, start there, all right? That, that had a major impact. So I think we know what the problem is. Then the question is, well, you know, what, what's the solution? And so as, as Marilyn noted, the solution uh, comes in, in partnerships. A representative Hefley can't do it on his own, nor can Senator Udichak or, or the county commissioners or any borough council. Uh, you need a, a team approach. First and foremost, use the tools that the State House and the Senate and several governors now have given you. Those tools are much more powerful in law than they were 10 years ago. And, uh, and I'm pretty certain we're going to strengthen them even further uh, this session with uh, some new anti-blight uh, statutes. You've also got to take some risks. Someone asked me, you know, how did Tamaqua become the first small town Chris in the state? And the answer is their borough council was one of the only borough councils in the entire state that was willing to spend more than a year filling out the application. They actually had to do it twice and again and again and again, but they never gave up. And that program alone means a couple hundred thousand dollars to them now uh, each year. Same thing with Schuylkill County. They received 1.4 million for, for demolition. Uh, they took a chance. They, they came to me, they came to Jerry, they came to our, our colleagues in the house and said, look, you know, this is really important to us. But even more importantly, the county commissioners there enacted their own demolition fee which they now can do under terms of a, a new law, 
And that then provides them with the matching money. So they're not asking the state for everything. The, the commissioners there did, did their fair share to come up with some, some local uh, money as well. And I'm pretty certain that they wouldn't have gotten the big grant if they would not have been able to come up with the, the matching dollars on their own. Now, I know Carbon County has not yet done this. Uh, according to, to Mary Beth, let's see, the uh, number in Carbon County would bring 67,000 uh, new dollars in a year for demolition. I realize that's not a lot of money. But over five or ten years, that starts to add up. Doyle, you remember uh, Sam Smith from Punxsutawney, uh, Speaker of the House. Sam was not the most eloquent legislator I ever met, but when I was sitting next to him one day, he said to me, everything in public policy is incremental. No one goes home with the whole loaf that they wanted. You've got to do it slice by slice. And that would be my, my suggestion today, uh, that gradual implementation approach. Uh, Representative Knowles has heard me say that uh, if I ever write that poli-sci textbook for the classes I teach, on page one is going to be Argyle's Law, which is everything in government takes a hell of a lot longer than I want it to, but you've got to start, and I think today you're off to a good start. So thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I'd like to introduce Harold Pudliner, the chairman of the board of Carbon County Redevelopment Authority. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, I am chairman of the board of the Redevelopment Authority, but I am also the borough manager and code enforcement for the borough of Weatherly. I have been code enforcement for 22 years. That means I've been chasing people with blight and all kinds of problems for that period of time. And actually, I'm here to pretty much inform some of the panelists here as what it's like in the field. As you, all of you may know, how many zoning officers or code enforcement officers are here? Two, three, okay. Then you understand and you'll know as I go through uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, in the borough of Weather, we had issued uh, 1,050 enforcement letters during my term here and 161 citations. And of those citations, I've been before the magistrate at least 100 times. I've been before the uh, Court of Common Pleas at least over a dozen times. And uh, the timing, how should I say this? The timing of the system, it takes a while, it takes a long time to get through, to get to the final product. Uh, from the time that I send an enforcement letter out, it may take 10 to 15 days, whatever you choose to give these people to correct the problem. Uh, after that, you then go to citation. After it goes to citation, uh, you're waiting for the magistrate to give you a court date. That could be anywhere from a month to two months until you're before the judge. Then hopefully when you're before the judge, you don't get a continuance which pushes it off another month. I've had situations where uh, two continuances and I was already into winter and there was nothing more that you could do because you're not gonna clean up a house or do anything during the winter periods. So there are a lot of, lot of things that uh, we have to look at and deal with at our level, you know, in trying to get rid of the blight. Uh, we also have the situation on mortgage foreclosures. What happens there is Generally, when uh, somebody's going to be foreclosed on, the people move out, usually in the middle of the night or on weekends. And uh, the bank goes through their process, and they, they get the uh, property. But what happens is the, the bank doesn't take title. So I can't go after the people that left, and I can't go after the bank because they're not the deed holder. Some provision has to be made that banks have to be held responsible once they they take over the properties otherwise we just we just stand there and, and uh, have to wait until something uh, proceeds you also have to deal with the out-of-state property owners in the time that it takes to send your notices to them and generally those are the ones that you get the most continuances on so you could be dragging these processes out for over six months until you you finally get into court and then what happens, and it happens on a lot of occasions, where once your magistrate has made a decision, 
they'll turn around and appeal it. Then you're waiting for an appeal date, you know, in the court, and there could be another two or three months. So in all this time, the condition of the properties are deteriorating more and more and more. Now, bear in mind, you're not only doing one at a time, you're doing maybe six or seven houses at a time or, or situations that you're dealing on trying to get these situations cleared up. Uh, I think uh, demolition. The best, the, the easiest way for us to do to work with demolition on these on these houses that are so bad is to uh, get them out of the county repository, which we're we're doing right now, on uh, two blighted houses, and uh, in that case we turn around we own the property, but uh, in any other case. Uh, generally, what you're going to wind up doing is you're hiring a professional engineer to determine that the house has to be uh, demolished and then uh, going before a judge and asking for a court order to take that house down. And again, here we're looking at very long periods of time. Uh, the, uh, I asked you know, the panelists and Representative Hefley, if as they're drafting their new uh, laws, that they can address some of these these items, particularly uh, on the situations with the bank where we have no contact or no no source to be able to go after anybody. Uh, in our time there, we've done we demolished uh, 12 homes in the 22 years I've been there, and we've also taken down uh, one large warehouse that uh, it was about the size of an, it was an acre large, the warehouse that we had taken down. Uh, so the, uh, the process is long and it's arduous and sometimes extremely frustrating as these guys, you know, probably can attest to. And the only thing, you're also not working only with houses, you're, looking, you're working with abandoned vehicles uh, people leave their vehicles behind or you're, you're spending a lot of time chasing that and I hope that's another item that you know they're looking to address as far as uh, this blight. Uh, we also, you're also dealing with the fact that okay you have these houses sitting there, you have no ownership and it's summertime. Grass is growing like crazy and naturally, the borough is expected to, to maintain. So you're out there contracting someone to keep the grass down. And in some cases, you know, we were talking about maybe 12, 13 properties at a time where you're paying to have this done and then putting liens on the properties. So it is uh, a continuous uh, problem, and it's an arduous problem on getting anything done. It's just like uh, you said, you, in government, everything takes a long time. So uh, we've been working very di diligently on, on our blight problem in Weatherly. And uh, from the field aspect, uh, it, takes, it takes a lot of time and a lot of work. And what's happening is, is that your residents are turning around and looking at you and so why isn't anything getting done? Why do I have to live next to this house that looks this way? Or why are these abandoned cars, you know, here? Well, it's all part of the system, and we tried to explain to them that it could take months or even a year before you can get a house down or, or clear a property. So I just wanted to bring to everybody's attention, and being in the field and doing this, you know, what the pitfalls are and what we're facing all the time. Uh, out there trying to in enforce. Now we adopted the property maintenance ordinance, which is a very good ordinance. Uh, it works very well for us. It's just a matter of all the timing and situations that you run into that you have to go through to, to clean up the, the blight. And uh, that's really all I have at this point. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Harold. And uh, and that's one of the things that w that we take back with us in, to Harrisburg. Actually, I, I have 
working on legislation right now uh, to address the issue with LLCs and finding uh, who actually owns the properties during the sheriff's sale. And we're working, Mary Beth is helping with some language to, to get that drafted properly. But we've also passed a series of bills to combat blight again this session as we have last session. And I'll have a, a list of that. We can get, I can get you a list if anybody's interested in some of that legislation that we're working on. Uh, I did miss two folks. Um, when I did all my introductions uh, earlier, I just wanted to introduce uh, Chris Galata, retired executive director of redevelopment and housing authorities of, of uh, Cumberland County. Chris. And, uh, and Mark, or Paul, Paul Mc McNosky. McNasky, a Northeast Regional Director of DCED. Uh, so I'd like to uh, next, I'd like to introduce Rick Villello, Pennsylvania DCED, Deputy Secretary for Community Affairs and Development. Um, I really am honored to be here today. Um, it is a topic that's close to my heart, and I'll share with Harold and you uh, a little bit about my path to DCD because there is some overlap with our experience. But I'll ask you if you have a pen or paper. Um, the spelling of my name is on the agenda, and before I got to DCD, I was the mayor of Lock Haven for 15 years, three months, two days, and 20 hours. <laughs> and it was, it's something that I miss actually every single day because of having an impact on a community and, and making a difference. Um, but the mayor before me wasn't the best mayor ever. And he came, he actually worked against me all election day um, back in 1999. And after working against me all day long, he came to my victory party and put his finger in my face and said, the best thing you can do is get an unlisted phone number. Well, sometimes I'm not very good at taking advice. And so since that day, every opportunity I have um, is I give out my cell number and I give out the direct line to my desk. So um, my role is to help you and to be accessible. Um, so my cell number is 570-263-0578, 570-263-0578. And the direct line to my desk is 717-720-7400. Um, don't call it now, my phone is laying over there. Um, I'm pretty sure I put it on silent, but don't call it now. Um, I was actually up in Youngdale near Warren, and my phone rang like I didn't give the, the thing to say, not don't call it now, and my phone rang right after I gave out my number, and it was a guy in back, and he raised his hand, and he said, that's me, and I'm like, well, I'm right here. <laughs> what are you doing? He goes, oh, he goes, I dated a whole lot in the 70s, and a lot of times the girls gave me a wrong phone number. <laughs> and he said, I was just making sure you gave your right number. And um, so my view to public service is, you know, local government is special. Um, and I, while my time in local government, I became a local government nerd and realized that, you know, when you're, the closest to the people, you deal with a lot of things you didn't expect. Um, before I ran for mayor, I start, started on the zoning hearing board and then went to planning commission. And um, the, um, before I was married, my girlfriend's landlord was the city of Lock Haven's code official. And I had worked construction, and he convinced me that the state was planning to pass the UCC and that I should get certified um, to be a code inspector. So I took his advice. Um, well, one of the things he did, he volunteered me for the zoning hearing board. So I didn't have much choice. If I was going to hang out on his back porch and drink his beer, I had to volunteer for the zoning hearing board, but I also took his, his advice and got certified to be a code inspector. 
Um, I had spent 20 years in the construction industry and moved all the way through all of the code inspection stuff to become a master code professional. Um, started my own business, which was a third party agency. Um, it was third party agency A136 Vallello Building Inspections and worked in a three county area of Clinton Center and Lycoming counties. Um, I didn't do work in the city of Lock Haven because I was mayor, but I did all of the surrounding areas. Um, and then, you know, while being mayor, um, realizing the challenges that local elected officials, local code officials have, and, you know, serving, you know, the four terms, um, supported Governor Wolf um, during his election. And um, my mayor's job paid $37.50 a week. Um, so the code inspection and construction management is what I did full time. And we went to Governor Wolf's uh, election party and we were coming home and my wife said, what are you gonna do next? I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you're not running for a fifth term as mayor. Um, you like this stuff too much. What are you going to do next? And I was like, what do you mean? She said, you need to send the governor a letter saying, if he's interested, you're interested. And he sent me back a note saying, where are you interested in going? And DCD... Um, and when I look at my contacts in my phone, the state agency that I had the most contact with was DCD. So I sent in the letter that I sent to the governor, I said, I'd like to land at DCD if you're interested. He sent back to me that he was interested. I started at DCD at the Governor Center for Local Government Services. Um, and all 2,560 municipalities in Pennsylvania fall under the center's purview. And the center's role is to help you be more effective, whether it be in code enforcement, whether it be in police, whether it be in fire, whether it be financial management, um, whether it be you know, stoning and chipping a road or running a chainsaw, you know, our role is to help every elected official in Pennsylvania do their job better. And the, most people know there's 2,560 municipalities. Uh, most people know the largest one, which is the city of Philadelphia. Most don't know that the smallest is East Keating Township in Clinton County with 12 residents. 12 residents and the expectation is with the next census they'll have five residents you know they cover 70 square miles with five permanent residents right now so the challenges are very diverse when you go around the state and with the 2560 municipalities there's almost 16,000 local elected officials. Um, so I tell people my time as mayor was the best internship ever from my code enforcement in in background to we had to build a new sewage treatment plant. We had to upgrade our water filtration plant. We own and operate what was Piper Airport. Um, we have a levee around the city of Lock Haven. So we had to deal with FEMA and Pima and the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, the water and sewer infrastructure, you know, we had full-time police. We had a hybrid fire department with paid and volunteer. So now at DCD, I get to work with really smart people and to help solve your problem. And it's a good thing I have really smart people because anybody that has run for election five times can't be very smart. And you need really, really smart people to help you do your job. 
and um, I'm honored that Evelyn is with me, Paul is with me, Andrew's with me, and even kind of indirectly, Chris is with us um, because of the team that I have. And I say Chris because we support the Housing Alliance and the Galata Group does a lot of our technical assistance. So, you know, not only do I get to work with really smart people that I can call on really smart people like Chris to send him places and help pay his expenses to help you do your job. And blight is like cancer. You know, it's all throughout the state. Um, the estimate is that there's 860,000 blighted structures in Pennsylvania. Um, the large, the most are in the city of Philadelphia. The estimate is, and it, I'm sure these numbers are low, but the estimate is that there's 80,000 blighted structures in the city of Philadelphia. So that means there's at least 780,000 structures around the rest of Pennsylvania. And why I say it's like cancer, you know, it starts out small and it usually goes unnoticed for a long, long time. You know, think about the, the structures in our hometowns. You know, think about the structures that you drive by on the way to work. Um, think about the structures that you've driven by coming here today and how long it takes before we really even start addressing the problem. You know, and think about in the neighborhoods where, you know, it's grandmom or grandpop living alone, and then grandmom or grandpop passes away, and the kids have moved away, and, you know, nobody wants to buy the house, and then suddenly there's a broken window, and then there's two broken windows, and then the paint's peeling and the roof is leaking, and suddenly now it's almost unsavable. And, you know, and in some cases you can identify uh, an owner, but, you know, sometimes you can't identify an owner. And the properties go to sheriff sale or judicial sale, and people from New York City or somewhere else buy it because they watch too much HGTV and think they're going to flip it and make $100,000. Um, but it doesn't happen overnight. And it's a, a cycle. Suddenly, like, there's one house in a neighborhood, and then somebody says, well, I don't want to live next to that house anymore. We better move. And then there's two houses, and then there's three, and then suddenly the whole row or the whole block is blighted. And each time, the challenge gets progressively more difficult to solve. You know, when it starts out with just a broken window, you know, sometimes you can respond quickly. But when it's the whole structure, it's that much more difficult. And, you know, did it start out with by somebody just not cutting their grass or shoveling their snow? You know, when did the problem start? And, you know, while we're doing that, you know, think about the family that has two, three, four kids, and one of the kids has cancer. Well, you know, if that is the blight, well, you have to take care of the kid with cancer, but you also have to take care of your other children, whether it be getting them to band practice or football practice or baseball or things. So, you know, you have to take care of the blight, but you have to do all of the other municipal functions that we do. And when you think about our families, you know, you have to take care of the problem, but you also have to take care of the healthy stuff. And it's not getting any easier. Um, so I'm really fortunate that I get to work on the distressed communities and I get to work with the Keystone program 
and all of the stuff that DCD does to try to help you. And places like Tamaqua and other places that are doing well know about what we do. And, you know, it's, it's good to help them. But my job is to get to the places that don't know what we do and say, you know, let's start with this. Let's put a plan together, whether it be a blight plan, a revitalization plan, a master plan for the future. And then let me help you work with DCNR, work with DEP, work with PennDOT to bring the jigsaw puzzle because it's confusing. And then the other reason I give out my cell number is when I was in construction management and code inspection and doing my mayor's job part time, you know, it would be coffee break or lunch break or trying to get a call in before five o'clock to solve something. Well, you know, our role as public servants is to get the job done. And, you know, sometimes you'd call in and you would get passed from person to person and, you know, that person not be, and your coffee break runs out. And you'd go, now what am I going to do? Well, one good thing, maybe it's not like calling a senator or a state rep, but you know, they can help put you in the right direction. But it's really cool when your deputy secretary and somebody calls with a problem and they say, well, we've been trying to contact PennDOT or we've been trying to contact DEP and we just want an answer. Can you help us get an answer? You know, one of the advantages is I can usually get somebody to call me back. And if they call me back, I can usually get somebody to call you back. So now we've gone through four years with Governor Wolf. And one of the things that I always bring to the table are tools that local government officials need to do their job. And for a while, I don't think I had the loudest voice, but I am really excited by the governor's restore proposal. You know, I know there are some controversial parts to it, but when you think about soar and water infrastructure, when you think about broadband, when you think about fighting blight and the things that are in the restore proposal, you know, it's a local government initiative. The average, average age of soar and water infrastructure is 70 years old. You know, do you think the people that were putting in the pipes and the sewage treatment plants 70 years ago thought that they would still be functioning in 2019? You know, it's, it's a crisis that we're not talking about. Um, and when you look at real estate taxes and the things and the services we have to provide as local government officials, you know, real estate taxes are tapped out. When you look at funding everything from school districts to county prisons, you know, we can't stretch real estate taxes any further. You know, so when we're looking at soar and water and blight and broadband, you know, these are huge, huge dollar, huge everything investments in all of our future and we talk about broadband well you know a hundred years ago the conversation was electricity you know and then it was telephone service and now it was broadband and it's a huge state to cover and somebody says well they don't want to serve 12 houses up on the mountain because it's not cost effective. But would anybody think of having a house today without electricity or phone service? Well, a few people might. <laughs> but most of us wouldn't even consider not having, you know, electricity, telephone, sore, water, and broadband's that next step. So, you know, it's something that our children, their children, have to think about. 
And we have to start thinking in 20, 30, 40, 50 year increments, not two and four year increments. And one of the things I say all the time is, I know I'm a Phillies fan. I know the All-Star game is coming in 2026 to mark the 250th year of the United States. We're a young country. We're a young place. And, you know, when I was mayor, I would really get frustrated by hearing people say, you know, back in 1950, they needed to have a crossing guard on Main Street. That was the golden age. Or back in 1965, we were really in our golden age, or 1970. Do you think in England they say, you know, back in 1278, we were really hopping town? Or in Rome, they go, back in 32, you know, we can't think that way. You know, our future, you know, just think about Notre Dame Cathedral that just burnt. It was started construction a thousand years ago and was under construction for almost 200 years. Imagine if we proposed a project in one of our municipalities that would have been would be under construction for more than a year or two years or three years. You know, our parents and grandparents built amazing churches, amazing libraries, built the infrastructure that we're living off of today. We have to figure out what the right size our communities are, what the right infrastructure is, what the right services are to provide, and how to pay for it. And we have to do that collectively. You know, the average age of elected officials is getting old. You know, who's gonna follow in our footsteps in leadership roles? You know, in fire and police and all of those services we expect, you know, what are we going to hand to our children and grandchildren? Um, I know I covered a bunch of stuff. Um, Andrew is coming up next. Um, the center is there to provide services. If I can help you in any way, do your job better, please don't he hesitate to reach out. And I'll look forward to some of the questions at the end. Thank you. Do we need to do we need to turn the lights down a little bit or um, maybe no we got them you want to come up here If for any reason you can't see the presentation, there are a few open seats in the front yet. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy. Um, as Rick said, my name is Andrew Sheaf. Uh, I live in Lancaster, but I work out of Harrisburg for DCED. And um, I actually have the pleasure and the privilege of working for the Center for Local Government Services. Um, it's really an honor to be here speaking for you guys today and to be on this esteemed panel. Um, just give me one moment here while the, the PowerPoint uh, warms up. So um, in my role in the Center for Local Government, sir, in Center for Local Government Services, um, I spend a lot of my time working on issues with distressed municipalities. If you've ever heard of the Act 47 program or the early intervention program. That's where I spend the most of my time um, trying to help problem solve when, with some of those critical financial issues. Um, but um, I um, work for Rick. Uh, sorry, can you guys hear me? Is that better? Great. Um, and in the center, Rick really you know, lets us know that our job and our mission is to be out in the field being proactive, trying to figure out what the problems are in local governments, finding solution to those, finding solutions to those problems, and putting together maybe trainings or different sessions 
or um, some other ways to present the tools that are in your toolbox to do your job better. So um, with that being said, if I could just take a quick poll, uh, if you could raise your hand if you ever receive calls about blight in your communities. <laughs> okay. We've asked that, I ask that wherever I go, and it's generally a, a pretty universal um, raising of hands that I see. Um, you know, there's this place on my street, it's next to me, it's behind me, it's causing me a headache, I can't enjoy my property, maybe I want to go and sell my property, and I can't, I can't even sell my property. So we're all familiar with those calls. And then the question is, uh, what do you do as a locally elected official to try to deal with those situations? And that was kind of the thrust of this PowerPoint presentation, some of these uh, presentations we put on around the state. Some things I'll cover today are an overview of tools that you can use to help uh, proactively address blight and also available funding sources to help local governments address blighted properties. It's really critical to know what's available to you, what's out there, and how you can obtain those resources. As I said, I, I spend a lot of my time working on financial issues with distressed municipalities. So one of the things that's always first and foremost in my mind is how much things are costing places. This slide is just a, a brief example of some of the costs of blight. A few examples of those costs are paying for your code enforcement departments. The more issues you have, maybe the more you know, money and resources you have to put into code enforcement. Public safety, blighted and abandoned property increases police and fire calls and it decreases community safety. Um, it's a public nuisance, it can be a hazard for children. More resources are devoted to public safety, the more blight you have. Public works, things like mowing grass and you know paying money to um, board up houses, along with the expensive cost of demolition, which sometimes that's the only option for some of these properties. So all of that is money that's going out the door from your local governments to address blight. There's a whole other side to the equation, which is the municipal revenue portion. So blight also reduces municipal revenue. First and foremost, real estate taxes. Um, a, lot of, a lot of blighted and abandoned properties are also tax delinquent. So these are places that you're not receiving your real estate taxes on, which is one of the main pieces of your local budgets. Blake can also, it also does, depress property values. So that's also keeping your real estate, um, real estate revenue down. Another main revenue source for local governments is earned income tax. If you, are, if you have to demolish houses or if you have housing stock that's not habitable, those are people and families that can't live in, you know, live in your community. And hence, less people paying earned income tax. So it's not just what you're paying for blight, it's also what you're not receiving in terms of some revenue streams if you have a major issue with blight. There's a group called, um, they're in the Mon Valley, which is in Washington County, um, sort of southwest Pennsylvania. They, they border Allegheny County, they're right outside of Pittsburgh. And they did a study, they got together uh, 41 different municipalities and they calculated that blight and vacant properties cost their municipalities $11 million a year in direct costs. So that's the first part of the equation. And they also calculated that they lose $9 million in tax revenue a year. So this is obviously a significant um, issue um, there and in other places that are driving costs and depressing your, your revenue and making it harder to run your local government. So because we're the Center for Local Government Services and we like to provide solutions to problems and stuff that thing, that tools that you can use right now, today, tomorrow, um, you don't have to wait for the state or the federal government. Um, we like to try to talk about tools that are already in your toolbox um, that you can start implementing. And the one that we always mention first and foremost is uh, property maintenance code. 
And property maintenance code is in place ideally for prevention. Because if you're going to try to prevent blight, it's a lot cheaper than having to remediate um, housing stock or redevelop certain tracts of land. What the property maintenance code is, is it's an enforceable legal framework. It takes the maintenance of buildings and surrounding properties from an option to a legal requirement. And the goal in all of these cases is voluntary compliance. You want everybody to voluntarily come into compliance and not have to go to court. However, if you do have to take somebody to court, eventually you have this framework in place which you can build a case on to make your case to a district magistrate. It sets a clear standard, sets clear standards for property owners, so it allows everybody to know what's required of them in terms of maintaining their property. If you're going to try to implement any of these tools, which I'll talk about, it's really important to try to educate property owners before you would roll them out. So maybe send out a letter that lists uh, common violations just to give them a heads up that this is coming around the bend. These are the expectations now. And what we do eventually adopt, probably the most well-known is the International Property Maintenance Code. Uh, some places adopt this in, their, in its entirety. It's actually a really long document. So you can also adopt just part of it or find a way to streamline what's going to work best for your local government. I think uh, Chris Galata actually at one point shared with me uh, a, um, a streamlined um, short sort of abridged version of the International Property Maintenance Code. Because what you d adopt, you really want to make sure you enforce and you want to try to enforce it uniformly. Um, how would you, uh, how do you pay for uh, a program like this? Fines, help pay for enforcement. Uh, you could also maybe contract with a third party. And we also see local governments working together to have sort of a multi-municipal code enforcement operation. We've seen some great success with that as well, possibly through a COG, a Council of Government. This is a recommended, I would say this is a recommended first step after you have a property maintenance code in place. It's called, uh, qual it's called quality of life ticketing. You can issue code violation tickets, which are similar to parking tickets for nuisance violations, such as uncut grass or weeds, accumulation of rubbish and junk vehicle appliances in the yard. So it's not a citation that's enforceable by the courts. You all have limited time to spend in court, limited you know, money to spend through court fees or what have you. This is just a quick way to um, have your police officer, have a code enforcement officer or some type of municipal employee in the field. They see a code violation, bang, you can write them a ticket, $25. You have 10 days to come into compliance. And we've seen really great success with municipalities using this option. You can increase fines if um, they don't come into compliance. So maybe it's $25 at first and then $50 up to $100. But the point is you're staying out of the court system and we've seen a great success in getting these small violations taken care of pretty quickly. Because like Rick said, it can spread. You know, let's say your neighbor starts, stops cutting their grass and you can write them a ticket or you could do nothing and the neighbor beside them will also stop cutting their grass. Or maybe somebody will leave a, decide to leave a refrigerator in their front yard um, because blight spreads if you're not proactive about it. And one of the themes of this presentation is um, the prevention piece is a lot cheaper and more manageable than some of the things which can come down the road later on. Uh, many places use handheld devices which can be used to just automatically ticket on the spot and you have a, an electronic record to keep track of. Um, it's something I'd be happy to talk about with you guys afterwards. Rental property registration. I would say this doesn't necessarily work everywhere. Um, some places you don't have a lot of rental properties. Some places you only have really wonderful, fabulous landlords. Um, but in other municipalities, uh, it can be a real problem 
rental properties are a real source of a, of a burden, um, a burden on places. What this does is preemptively addresses burdens of problematic rental properties. Again, you're trying to bring rental properties into compliance before having to go to court or use some other method. It's done by ordinance, and in the ordinance, ordinance you need to clearly spell out um, how it will work to avoid confusion, how the registration process will, will, will work, if there's an inspection schedule, the duties of the owners, um, any enforcement mechanisms, and if there's an appeal process. We have samples of these ordinances if you'd like to see them. And public education is always key, uh, with this one included. It requires owners of rental properties to register the properties with the municipality before leasing. So you'll have a list of everybody um, in your municipality who, um, who has a rental property. It can really help um, to see patterns of problem places within your municipality. Also, let's say there's an emergency at a place. Um, it's, you, you see the renter there, but it's the property owner who really needs to deal with the emergency. You have a list of everybody's phone number right there. There's a lot of ways to implement it. Um, most commonly, they will provide contact information, pay an annual fee for an inspection, and make it available for whenever your ordinance would require that inspection. Sometimes that's annually, sometimes that's biannually. Um, sometimes it's actually whenever the property is under a new renter. We've seen great success with this. And it's not a money maker. Um, you really just want to set the fee for the same amount it, it costs to implement the program. Lastly, uh, the home repair and rental rehabil rehabilitation. So home repair programs can help keep housing stock in repaired and in good working order. Um, I've seen some studies that have shown there are thousands of properties that aren't blighted, but they're just one repair away of you know, starting down that track of becoming blighted. Um, we we'll often see loans, low interest loans, um, and I'll talk about some funding sources later on here in just a minute, but low interest loans, grants, or uh, tax abatements. These programs can give owners resources to bring their homes up to code. Um, you're not gonna just start giving out low interest loans and grants to anybody. These are after a homeowner has been cited for substantial violations and they prove they're unable to fund. And usually these are targeted at an elderly population or some other, possibly a disadvantaged veteran might take advantage of something like this if, if your municipality would like to provide it. Um, it helps to ensure that properties are not ultimately abandoned. I read another study which showed that if you can't fix some of these minor code violations, there's a good chance that you're going to abandon your house within five years if you can't afford some of these minor costs for upkeep. So not only is this keeping some needy people in their houses, it's also trying to bridge that gap and not um, have people abandon their houses or not have some minor problems become major blighted problems. I'm running a little short on time, I think. So I'm gonna kind of go through this one quick. And there are actually people on this panel who could speak on this much more eloquently than I can, who have actually gone through the process. But I did want to mention conservatorship as another tool in your toolbox. Um, it was brought about in 2008, and it's a legal process where a petitioner can go to court and petition to become um, a third party conservator. Who can be a petitioner? A uh, municipality, a school district, a redevelopment authority, a neighbor or a nonprofit organization can be a petitioner. More often than not, we see local governments as the petitioner and ultimately the, the appointed conservator when this is all said and done. You can't just do this to any property. It has to be legally, legally um, it has to be unoccupied for 12 months, not been marketed for 60 days, owned for six months and not in the foreclosure process. And it also has to meet your typical blighted conditions. It's a public nuisance, it's a risk of fire, it's unfit for habitation. Ideally, 
you have a property maintenance code in place and maybe a ticketing ordinance in place too, and you've already have a whole file on a place that you would want to bring to conservatorship. You have all the tickets, you have maybe some citations, you have some pictures, maybe have some, you have some documented fire and police calls at this place, and you're going into really long-term problem properties where nothing else works. An owner can step in at any time to terminate this conservatorship, but they have to reimburse the petitioner and conservator for all costs incurred. The court supervises this process the whole way through. Oftentimes, we see this end up in a, a demolition. Um, or it could, you know, before you get to demolition, you could get in and rehab a place too, because costs are always, um, you know, critical in something like this. So when it's all said and done, the conservator could seek permission to demolish or sell the property. This is, I describe it as sometimes uh, a cheaper and quicker way than eminent domain. Although I don't want to give you the impression that this is cheap or quick, um, <laughs> but it's an option and it's sometimes something worth taking a look at. And if you think it's right for you, we could help connect you with some of the resources or some of the people who know more about this. Whenever we do one of these presentations, uh, the question is, all right, this, all this stuff's great, but um, how do we pay for it? Some of this stuff pays for itself, like uh, the ticketing ordinance or the property maintenance code, but obviously some of these other things require additional funding. These are some programs at the state that you could take advantage of. First is the Keystone Communities Program. This funds a lot of things. If you're familiar with the Main Street Program, um, it's used to fund the Main Street program and in Elm Street, but it's also really flexible and funds can be used for almost any public improvement, including, particularly for this presentation, acquisition, demolition, and rehabilitation of blighted properties. And there is a match for the program. Next up is the Neighborhood Assistance Program. So these are tax credits received for making contributions that revitalize or stabilize distressed areas. A private company in this case, a lot of times a bank, will donate to a local program using that local infrastructure that's already in place to um, implement some kind of project that's going to be benefit neighborhoods and your communities. Um, projects can include rehabilitation of commercial or industrial buildings or the removal or elimination of physical blight. Both of those programs are run by DCED, so if you have any further questions, I'd be happy to, uh, to talk to you about those programs. The last one here isn't run by DCED, but is, um, it comes from state money. It's called FAIR. And these are funds to increase safe, affordable housing opportunities and strengthen existing housing stock while addressing long-term affordability. A lot of these funds comes from the state transfer fund, state realty transfer fund. Um, at least 30% of the funds must be used for households below 50% of the median area income. So those are some state resources. Um, here are some things that locally you can do without, without us or without the state. LERDA, many of you are probably familiar with the Local Economic Revitalization Tax Assistance Program. So the way this works is a community designates property as deteriorated within their municipal borders. And the goal then is to have every taxing authority sign off on one of these LERDAs. And what it does is gives you a tax abatement on increases or improvements to that property. So if you have um, a property that's really not worth anything, if it's an LERDA, if you rehab it, you won't necessarily, you won't be paying the full property tax on it right away. That's deferred, usually over 10 years and at a 10% rate. Next, the tax increment financing program. In this case, a governing body works with an authority to create a TIF, a TIF district. The authority then borrows money through a bond issue, uses that money to redevelop the property and pays back the bond with future tax revenue. 
Um, Act 152, one of our newest tools in the toolbox. This allows counties to authorize the recorder of deeds to charge and collect an additional fee not to exceed $15 for each deed and mortgage recorded. And it's to be used exclusively for the demolition of blighted property in the county. We collect a report on how this is used, but the state is not gonna mandate or get in the way of how, how you ultimately, or the county would ultimately decide to use these funds. This is the county's money. Um, and it's their program. Similar to Act 137, this allows counties to increase fees charged for the recording of deeds and mortgages to be used for affordable housing needs. And this is a running list, I think this is the most accurate list of all of the communities that have, uh, all the counties that have passed the 152 recorder of deeds fees. That brings me right about to my time. Um, thank you for your time and attention, and I'd be happy to talk about any of this stuff afterwards. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, all that information will be available. Uh, for everybody. I also, I just want to give a shout out to Risa Hall. Risa uh, is uh, new to my office, but she's been there for about over a year now. Uh, and uh, Risa had really done all the legwork in putting this program together. So thank you, Risa, very much. Ed, you're... Uh, next, uh, uh, or next presenter is Ed Cristiano, Chris, Cristiano uh, from uh, Northumberland County. Thank you very much. I have a little handout that we put a little packet together. Does everybody have one? I'm going to go over, you know, some of the things we've done in Northumberland County. My assistant representative Moss are here, is here to assist me today. By the way, I was his driver today and he'd been telling people I was, and I heard the house pays well for drivers. So I, don't, I haven't gotten anything yet, but hopefully I will. So everybody has that and I'll just go over there. These are some of the things we've done. We, we've actually did this in uh, 2011, this same type of uh, blight summit. Uh, Senator Argel sat on it. He had mentioned uh, Senator Gordon, a good friend of ours, Representative Mosser, Chris Galata from the Galata Group, Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania. Um, I, I know we even had Mayor Pulaski of uh, Allentown, city of Allentown, and we did get some uh, very good information from him at that time. Um, it was mentioned today about code enforcement. That's where it starts. And, and, and to me, it's the toughest job I know. You know, people that do that and are on the field, that is the toughest job. But it does really start with code enforcement. Um, we had said when we did the, our blight, blight task force and put everything together and put our plan together that we wanted to stop the bleeding, reduce blight in our county. Um, and we've been very successful. We've done over 100 properties or have assisted. And a lot of it is some of the grants you've heard today. And I'm, I have some of that information here in our packet today. And, it's, and these are the, this is the funding source. I mean, that's where it starts. You do need the funding. And you're very fortunate um, to have, you know, the, the legislatures that you have here today. Senator Argel, I sit on his Black Fat Task Force that meets periodically and uh, sets the agenda of, of what's going on in Blight. Um, you know, Doyle, uh, Representative Knowles, and of course my state representative, uh, who formerly was on the Urban Affairs Committee, is now in the leadership role in the House, have been very supportive of everything we've done. So the idea is to uh, apply for the, this money and and um, have a plan. You need to put a plan. The, Gla the Glotta Group uh, has been working with us from the beginning, um, done an outstanding job. We put funding um, resources together and, and what's out there. And I'm just gonna go over real quick here. There's some ordinances in here. The first page, um, as I had mentioned in October 2011, I can't believe it's been that, that long, but we put this together. We, afterwards, after our Blight Summit came about, we hired the Galata Group and we put a series of three um, um, information sessions together, invited municipalities, Chamber of Commerce, 
local elected officials, state officials, uh, to sit on a panel and come up with a, a, a plan of how we we're going to move forward. And of course, funding is, is was the bottom line. Um, it's talked today. I know the chairman mentioned about uh, the redevelopment authority, the repository. That was our big source, you know, in uh, in the southern end of Northumberland County is where our, our biggest blight is. Uh, Shemokin, Mount Carmel, Coal Township areas. Um, it's like night and day in Northumberland County, and that's where we had had the biggest blight problem. So we went to the repository, um, and we're able to acquire properties. Now we we've asked the municipalities to be the lead agency in that and to acquire the properties, and we'd provide the funding. Um, while demolition is, is, was the only thing we could do with a number of them, we did rehabilitate a number of homes also, and we were able to sell them and then create program income on some of the programs I'll talk about today. In particular, we were able to, uh, in the uh, um, village of Atlas, Mount Carmel Township, we took a series of 10 properties that were blighted. Um, we're in a repository. There's one or two that we had to deal with um, bankruptcy and things like that. Munis municipality acquired them, um, used some Act 137 money, if anybody's familiar with that, through your county. Um, and it, again, it's a, it's a fee on, on deeds and mortgages up to $15. Um, we have that established also in Northumberland County. So we used that money to rip these pro properties down with the reuse plan of. Uh, Give me two years to get funding that I could build some townhouses. We were able to build five townhouses in a village of uh, Atlas. Uh, became award winning, not only state, regional, national award, um, one of the top 13 in the country. And it was just a simple thing. It's the concept of taking blighted properties, having a reuse plan, providing um, affordable housing for the elderly. Um, and it really cleaned that up. And it's a gateway. You know, those properties that we r ripped down was a gateway to Mount Carmel. Okay, Route 61, if you're coming through into uh, Mount Carmel, you couldn't even see these properties. They were so overgrown with garages bordering uh, Route 61. So um, now you can. You can see this property as you, you, you enter the borough of Mount Carmel. So... There's some of the things that we've done in, in trying to put a plan together to, um, to do this. Uh, the first page is just, again, in October of uh, 2011, we did start what, why we're here today, you know, to get this started. Uh, some of the strategies that was talked today about municipal ticketing, you know, that quality of life. I think Andrew mentioned that today. Uh, it was funny, I had a board meeting last night, and the chairman of uh, one of our municipalities sits on my board, and he said... Um, you know, that ticketing was the greatest thing that we got out of this summit. Uh, they started the first year, I think they did over a thousand tickets. They gave a thousand tickets, weeds, grass, you know, abandoned things. Uh, last year they did 100, he told me. You know, so it, it did take off and it, it was a deterrent, you know, moving forward. And it's funny you just said that to me last night. Um, Act 90 is just, um, it, it, it's an ordinance out there that the legislature provides. Uh, Senator Argyle mentioned about the tools that they have been providing. That was one of the early ones um, that was implemented. We asked the municipalities, and it's denying permits based on different things that um, you haven't done or should have been doing and not paying your taxes, back sore bills, things like that. So that's an ordinance I would encourage. And actually early in our our um, endeavor in this whole thing, we asked each municipality before they got funding to implement Act 90. So, I mean, that ordinance is out there, it is available, um, and if anybody needs anything, you can always get in touch with me and we'll get that to you. Um, of course, active uh, code enforcement, as I mentioned, is, is, is a must. Um, NAP, Neighborhood Assistance Program, that's one of the programs that um, we did early on. We had a bank donate $50,000 for a municipality to us. They do get a tax write-off. Under Blight, it's a 75% tax write-off. So for $50,000, it costs the bank $12,500 for a $50,000 donation. We ripped six properties down in the, in the borough of Mount Carmel. We're actually on our third 
Keystone grant. You know, I know that was talked here. Um, first one was a $500,000 grant. Now they all come with matches. Um, Keystone grant is a one for one, right, Chris? That it, right? It is a one for one. Okay, so where do you get the match at? You know, 500,000 to get another 500,000. Okay, the, the, the sources we use, as I mentioned, is Act 150, oh, well, I'll, I'll start with Act 137, um, the county's uh, affordable housing program. Um, there's Act 152, and I'll talk a little bit, that's a demolition, blight demolition that stays within the county. It could be used in the municipalities. That's also a, a, a fee on, on deeds and mortgages. Um, local CDBG, in, in North Liberland County, we have 36 municipalities. I believe we have seven, 29 non-entitlement CDBG and non-entitlement communities, and we have seven entitlement communities. And the, the, the municipalities I talked about, Cole Township, Shemokin, Mount Carmel are entitlement communities. So we ask them to commit up to 30% by law um, of their CDBG funds for our program. Now, a number of them did multiple, multiple years, you know, so which gave them more money out of our Keystone grant. Also in Northumberland County, the, for the non-entitlement communities, our county commissioners administer uh, the CDBG programs for those 29 non-entitlement communities. We've also asked them to commit um, up to 30% of their CDBG funds each year for blight remediation. So those, those were some of the matches that we use. And I also run a golf tournament. I, we have an AOAA park, ATV park. It does a ride for me every year, uh, fight the blight. Um, and they donate some money. So we have other, you need the sources. And really the CDBG is a, is a great source, source uh, to use, so. Um, we talked about conservatorship. You know, I know Andrew talked about that. We were able to, uh, we had a family in, in Northumberland County. Um, we took 13 properties from the family. And this was, these, these are properties that, you know, there was boxes of citations and fines that go back 25, 30 years. Absolutely did nothing, you know, to, to these properties. They were falling down, they were the worst of the worst. Um, just gave them a run around for a number of years. So we use some of our funds to hire an out of, out of uh, area uh, lawyer that's done a number of these. Uh, we took the 13 properties. There was two conservators that were named, the city of Shemokin and Cole Township. We used them as the conservator. We paid the legal costs um, out of Act 137 money, um, took, took them to court, um, was granted conservatorship, used some Keystone money to rip these down, and all of them been sold, which then becomes program income to be used for other, other uh, grants and other matches. So that was very successful. We're actually going to be terminating the conservatorship. Um, they, they've been sold, so I think there's one last step, as I understand. Chris, to, maybe you know. One last step in, in, in ending the conservatorship, so it's a done deal. Yeah. So... Um, you know, I talked about leveraging, and I talked about, well, we're on our third one that'll be coming up. I'll talk a little bit more about the last 500,000. Uh, Representative Mosser was in, instrumental in, uh, in securing those funds for us. So we'll be administering that last 500,000. We were also successful on uh, what's called, and it was mentioned here, is uh, RACP, um, some discretionary money within the budget that our state senator, Gordner, um, secured for us uh, for blight, you know, so uh, those applications are in and um, those, those are still coming up of what we didn't, didn't even do yet. Um, little handout that we did for our county commissioners, keeping them informed of what we're doing. Um, they're very supportive of our activities. In Northumberland County, we don't have a redevelopment authority, not a county redevelopment authority. It's, it, on paper, it's there, but it's dormant. Uh, probably 25, 30 years, nothing's been done. So some years back, with Representative Mosser uh, approaching me and like, kind of taking this on. It's not typical for a housing authority to do this. It's not a housing authority activity, believe me. Um, but it was something that meant a lot to me growing up in that area. 
um, that I wanted to do for the area, and they needed an agency to do it. So we were able to use our what I call our community partners, um, which everybody here in the room is a community partner here for what you know for the people that are here. So um, I, I definitely you definitely need that, and to control the media and, and the positive things because blight's not. One of the things that, uh, you know, there's a lot of positive things that go on, and we've been very fortunate in uh, just trying to do what we can do, you know, to make it better. Um, the Act, according to that letter, the Act 152, as I mentioned, it's a demolition fund. It's a dedicated fund that stays in your county. Um, last year, we just, um, as you can see by the letter here, I think it generates about $7,000, seven to $8,000 a month. Okay, so there was over $90,000 in it. And uh, actually, we just did receive that the other day. And it's, it's, a, it's a great source for a match. Again, you know, that's, that's, that's a match to leverage the other state monies that we talked about, the Keystone program, RACP. Um, there's not, as far as I know, a, a dedicated blights source out there. I know uh, uh, Rick talked about Restore Pennsylvania, and I know we had the governor actually came up two weeks ago, and we toured Shamoke and we did a walking tour and uh, um, of some of the stuff that's going on in Shamokin. So, and then he was out there to promote Restore Pennsylvania. So, uh, whether that happens or not, I know that it's a little controversial, and it you know on the funding and all, but I'd like to see somebody come to the middle, and that there is a, a source out there to tie into. So, that w possibly. Could be or not. Um, some of the highlights there in there, and I mentioned these again. Um, we had two NEP grants, one for fifty thousand dollars and one for eighteen thousand. And again, like I said, uh, the people that uh, are the recipients of that or do donate that get a seventy-five percent tax credit off their state taxes. So um, banks are a great source. We had, you know, like I said, fifty thousand dollars. Um, and then we had some other businesses to also donate back to the community. Um, Keystone was a 500,000, um, 200,000 we did receive. Um, again, they, they, these all take matches, so you know, just be aware of that and what sources are out there that you can tie into. And it, it actually worked pretty good for us once you got it started. Um, Talked about some home funding. I talked about Phoenix Court, and that it was funny. These ten properties, there was a fire, and they all, you know, burnt down at one time. And and uh, went to the municipality and said, what, "What do you think? What what should we name this place?" Well, Phoenix is the burning or the bird, you know, burning down or whatever. So in the ashes. So that's that's how that name came about. Uh, Rack P, as I said, it was seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. Act one fifty two, um, again, um, you know, is a great source along with Act one thirty seven, the affordable housing program, you know, for great reuse program. Um, yeah, we do have some other applications out there. The programs that in, I wanted to just put in here for you, uh, where to find them, the NAP program, just gives you a little information on the NAP program, Neighborhood Assistance Program. Um, the Demolition Fund, the Act 152, um, that's in here for your information. It just gives you some information um, of how we did it and the ordinance in there. Um, the ordinance is in there for you that we have, we adopted um, in Northumberland County. Uh, Rack P or Keystone program, just a little overview of the Keystone program, and, and again, uh, we're on our third one. You know, we've been successful. I know we've had Evelyn and, and Rick all come up at some time, and uh, you know, I've seen what what's what's we're trying to do in, in the municipalities. Um, Rack P, again, you know, that's out there. Um, um, I, I definitely recommend to stay close with your state elected officials and come up with a plan that they, they like to see and uh, can recommend, you know, to the department and so forth. So um, that's all I really have. Um, you know, I'll be available 
to hopefully answer any questions. Representative Moss, are you want to uh, just been a very good friend of, uh, of the authority and uh, um, he's always included in everything we try to do and, and I would highly re recommend that too. You know, stay close to, to your state elected officials. What's out there? He's always approaching me with different things. Uh, that, let's try this, or what, what do you think of that? Uh, actually, next Friday, one of my, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Shemokin coming into Shemokin. Well, next week we planned one of my pet peeves, and it's related to blight. And I, as I mentioned, that I do a golf tournament and get some other donation that's really non federal money, discretionary money. We're taking the Cameron Bridge and um, Shemokin, some of their football players and uh, uh, wrestlers are entering a state competition for weightlifting. And we're bringing them in. I hired a landscaper. We're going to just clean that bridge up uh, with weeds that are overgrown. You know, it's a new bridge that was built 15, 20 years ago. Stakes are still in the ground from, from the trees that they planted, you know, different things like that. So. We're going to be doing that next Friday, and and to me that's blight, you know, that's blight related activities that um, affect your community, the gateway to your your your, your municipality, uh, taking a corner property. Uh, one thing I can tell you, what the state likes to see is um, where you can have the biggest impact, not only within a county, within a municipality, within a four by four block area. Okay, if you nail that down to a specific area, state looks favorably on, on those type of application where you're going to have the biggest, biggest impact. In our situation, it's all over the place. So we haven't really got to a point where we can just take a certain area and work on a four by four block area. And I know the state does look favorably on, on things like that. So that's something you want to take a look at. Uh, Kurt, anything you want to say? Anything? I just want to, everybody can hear me. I got a pretty big mouth. I don't want to agree with that. Uh, Ed's done a fantastic job. Flight in our region, I think it's probably worse than what Carver County has. Doyle's got to take us on the floor and show us some of the problems that the county faces. But I think what Ed, through Chris Gallat, has helped. When we had this first summit, we had people who were energized, learning new ideas, you know, to form that task force, and that's where things really took off. And what it said, I think it plays well for the state because we did a county-wide approach instead of municipality by municipality. So we were ever able to leverage all the resources out there. So if you're just one municipality trying to do it by yourself, instead of doing it the county-wide aspect, First of all, the state looks favorably when you have inter-municipal cooperation. Uh, second of all, you're going to get a whole lot more funding opportunities than if you're doing it just by yourself, by through hopefully the county would, would impose that ordinance for the demolition fund. Second is the Act 137 dollars that are out there. And, and by doing that, and, and the only way you could draw down money was just by sitting on the sidelines and saying, we take some money. You had to implement certain things like the ticketing ordinance and, and certain other qualifications that maybe Chris can talk on later. But you couldn't just sit on the sidelines and say, yeah, can you give us some money out of this? You had to be proactive and initiate certain things to address blight before the task force would allocate money. And we've gotten a whole lot of things done uh, because of it. Um, the Keystone Communities Grant is the best grant in Pennsylvania. It's the best program in Pennsylvania. So that's the first thing I would look for. Uh, we've been so successful with that. And uh, um, I sit right next to Doyle, unfortunately, on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we talk about it a lot. And I'm um, glad to be able to come up here and see. Hopefully, you, you can follow a lot of things that we've done because we've been really successful. It's not a sexy issue to take on. Uh, Senator Argo could probably attest to this. It's probably the worst issue you could take on because now property taxes. <laughs> <laughs> because people are calling my office today. Can we get this property taken down? Well, it's not really me. It's a local issue, but um, we're, we're glad that we're, we're taking steps through Senator Argo, uh, having that task force in Harrisburg, 
and we want to keep adding tools to the toolbox to help you folks out. So. Thank you, Herb. Well, one last thing I did want to want to say, and what we've done as part of our our blight program was to to sponsor through the the Galata Group as a facilitator was a code enforcement training, okay, a seminar. We brought speakers in, um, you know, Harrisburg, um, who else, uh, a number of, uh, I, I'll tell you what, I got a, the best response from, I got the best response, I think, from the municipalities that they got more out of that, of what others are doing to, you know, take care of your, your problem your problems within your municipality or how you go about it. The interaction there was just off the walls that I thought that it, it, it actually was the best sessions that we had. And they thought we should do that more often. Because for the most part, you know, you come to this and then you leave and you forget. And, and, and you know, some are energized, some aren't. But that specific training, I thought, that we paid for out of our blight money, again, was very beneficial, I know, to the local uh, um, elected officials and, and code enforcement officers. And, and it, the, the three panel members that we had, I, I, I thought, did an excellent job. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Ed, uh, and thank you, Kirk, for coming down as well. Um, We'll have uh, Chris Galata is going to do a presentation. Uh, we're going to need the lights turned down again. No All right. If anybody in the back, there are some seats in the front if you're uh, having a hard time seeing the screen as well. While Chris gets uh, a couple things ready, I just wanted to, uh, to just uh, say real quick that uh, I wanted to thank uh, the chamber once again for hosting uh, or, or for sponsoring the, the luncheon. Uh, so after... Uh, after the presentation, we're going to hear from Kathy a little bit. And Kathy, uh, actually, talking about the LERTA program, uh, we just uh, implemented the LERTA program in, in Weisport. Still working on, on implementing that for the, some opportunities in Weisport. So, uh, and there are several municipalities throughout Carbon County who, who are using these tools already. Uh, and I appreciate everybody coming out today to, to just learn a little bit more about, about everything that's out there. So, Chris? Good morning. Uh, my presentation is on effective approaches for dealing with blight. One of the themes that you have heard this morning is the importance of focusing on blight prevention. Uh, Andrew made an excellent point that to the extent that you can prevent it or deal with blight at an early stage, you're going to save literally thousands of money. Uh, I'm also going to talk about some remediation approaches, and there's going to be a little bit of overlap between Ed's presentation, Andrew's presentation, and mine, but I'm going to do a deeper dive into some of the, some of the tools that I'm going to talk about that they may have mentioned as well. And then I'm also going to talk about the role of land banks in Pennsylvania. How many of have you have heard about land banks and the work of land banks in Pennsylvania? So I'd say about two-thirds of you, and uh, you know, I'm glad D.C. DCD raised your hands, that's good. Uh, but uh, it's a tool that is getting traction throughout the Commonwealth, and I think uh, you'll have an interest in learning more about that. So my presentation really in, in two parts. Uh, the first part is right-sized approaches to dealing with blight in small towns and rural areas. But before I get to that, and before I forget, um, the Housing Alliance would kill me if I didn't mention this. Uh, there is a publication. Uh, available through the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania, which has taken a leadership role in working on blight issues. And as Rick indicated, uh, they hired me, and in turn, uh, DCD hired the Housing Alliance to deliver technical assistance to communities across Pennsylvania, mainly Act 47 communities. But the, um, the Bible, if you want to call it that, in blight, is this compendium called From Blight to Bright. Anyone heard of that? This is a publication that is a compendium of strategies and approaches for addressing blight. Uh, every conceivable strategy that is available to you is, is in this publication. And it was just updated a few years ago, so it's relatively uh, up to date. Uh, so this is something that is available 
on the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania website. Again, from Blight to Bright is the name of the publication. Uh, the other thing I'd strongly recommend, particularly if you want to qualify for some of this grant money, which Northumberland successfully did, is that you do have, you do some planning at, at a county level or at least a municipal level and have a comprehensive strategy for addressing blighted properties. Um, this is uh, important. My experience as a former executive director of a redevelopment authority, uh, I learned uh, that uh, you need a plan of action, you need strategies, you need some goals and objectives, and, and in all candor, the state's looking for those when they're providing these funds. Uh, so one example of an approach is an approach I piloted, and I'm not selling my approach. In fact, I make the point in this booklet that describes how to do a blight plan that doesn't have to be done, does not have to be done by a consultant, uh, but basically this uh, blight planning approach has been used across the Commonwealth uh, in 10 municipalities and counties and basically gives you the game plan, the blueprint for pursuing uh, a, um, for developing a blight property uh, strategy. And, and this publication also on the Housing Alliance website, we can do this a five step fast track blight plan that really doesn't require a consultant. In fact, Armstrong County went through this process without a consultant and then brought me in to help them out with one of the strategies in their plan, which was the formation of a land bank. So again, you may want to take a look at that. So uh, let me talk about uh, right-sized approaches uh, for dealing with blight. Uh, this is a presentation that I developed for the Pennsylvania State Association of Boroughs several years ago. Uh, have any of you listened in on the, those webinars? Have you heard this presentation? Good, I worry about that because I have presented this now three times as a webinar and uh, it's been well attended, so I'm wondering whether uh, people have heard this, and it's good that you have not, so this will be new to you. Uh, I think that in Pennsylvania, Rick mentioned over 2,000 municipalities, many of those uh, have populations under 5,000. How many of you have a population in your municipality under 5,000 people? Okay. How many of you have a population under 2,500? under 2,500 people. So the struggle is resources. You know, where do you get the resources to have an effective uh, code compliance program? So in deciding what ordinances you want to, uh, that may be right for your municipality, you want to have a discussion about, let me stay with this slide. <laughs> You, you want to make sure that you have uh, ordinances for dealing with blighted structures that are easily understandable and up to date. You want to have ordinances that are right sized given the extent of the problem in the community and the capacity of the municipality to enforce. Uh, one size does not fit all. A municipality with 10,000 or 20,000 has more capacity and more resources to enforce codes than a municipality of 2,500. Uh, the ordinances must be reasonable uh, given the nature and extent of blight in a municipality. They should be appropriately appropriate given the resources available to enforce codes and the political realities. In some jurisdictions, uh, there is a fervent private property rights movement and some tools may not be politically acceptable, okay? So you need to take, get the lay of the land, which you have. Uh, what I'm gonna be doing today is, is sharing some uh, essentially tools that I think are appropriate for small and rural communities. Uh, these tools include uh, the ticketing ordinance, and I won't review what Andrew said about that, uh, I'll be able to get through that pretty quickly. Uh, a light version of a property maintenance code, and I'll go through each one of these. Uh, the fire insurance escrow ordinance, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, rental housing registration ordinance, which Andrew mentioned, and I'll talk about that, do a deeper dive into that. And then finally, you've heard about Act 90 of 2010 a couple times today. 
uh, basically that provides for the encumbrance of assets when someone is convicted of a code violation. Uh, I should say when you uh, have to take actions to repair uh, and, uh, an owner's property when they have not taken those actions and the municipality has incurred costs to undertake those repairs, uh, that you can place a lien not only against that property but any other properties owned by that individual in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. But I'll go through each one of these. So I'm going to really highlight five of these. As I go through this, I want you to visualize properties. One of the things I try to do is, uh, I guess, what they teach in uh, sports psychology, visualize. Uh, in the case of sports psychology, they visualize positive outcomes, making the putt, hitting the home run. I want you to visualize your toughest property, your most blighted property in your communities. I, as I go through this presentation, I want you to keep that property in mind and how some of these tools may be helpful in addressing that property. Uh, but you do want to talk about uh, as you deal with these properties, typical properties that are thorns in the side of a municipality. So you want ordinances that address typical problems. If you have problems that uh, uh, aren't apparent in your municipality and you have an ordinance that addresses an issue that, a problem that doesn't exist, then uh, think about why you have that ordinance on the book. Uh, you want to think about frustrations that are typically encountered in dealing with blighted properties and resources that you lack uh, to effectively address blighted properties. You need to have a discussion about these things. What can I do uh, with the resources I have? Given the political realities, uh, what can I accomplish? And given the nature and extent of the problem, what do I absolutely need to accomplish, particularly if I'm a small uh, municipality without resources? Uh, you also want to look at these questions or think about these questions uh, is the blight spotty or more widespread? Uh, what is the extent of absentee ownership? We've talked about that a little bit this morning. Uh, I think uh, your presentation, we talked about absentee ownership. Does a small percentage of properties account for most of the problems? That's typically the case. Uh, my guess is you spend 90% uh, of your time on about 20% of the properties. Are most complaints about exterior conditions of properties? Uh, to what extent are properties rental housing? In some municipalities, that's not an issue. It's pr primarily owner-occupied, but I find in a lot of communities that the, uh, the problem properties are disproportionately rental. And is the municipal budget big enough to stay on top of the problem? So these are questions you want to ask in contemplating what is a right-sized approach for my municipality. So a right-sized approach, again, one size does not fit all. You need to gauge what you can do as a municipality in order to accomplish what you need to accomplish in terms of code enforcement. Right-sized approach focuses your resources on the biggest problems, can provide you with some revenue to sustain the effort. Did you hear that? Can provide you with some revenue to sustain the effort. Uh, ears perked up. You're all interested in revenue. And is also manageable for your staff to administer. What I find in uh, small towns, typically uh, there's a nuisance ordinance, there's a dangerous structures ordinances. Frequently these ordinances have not been updated for years. So even if you don't have a property maintenance code, and as Andrew said, strongly recommend that you have a property maintenance code because if you're going to prevent blight, you've got to have a property maintenance code. Uh, your, your whole goal has to be to prevent blight, and the property maintenance code does that. But the uh, point is, uh, most municipalities uh, do have these older ordinances, nuisance ordinance, dangerous structures ordinance. Maybe you do have that property maintenance code, but if you don't have the property maintenance code, number one, think about adopting it, but by all means update those nuisance ordinances and the dangerous structures ordinance. Uh, other smaller municipalities, you have a property maintenance code, uh, but it may not be enforced because it's too complex and requires more staff than the municipality has. Um, Harold mentioned that, uh, or someone mentioned, the property maintenance, the International Property Maintenance Code, it's a great code, but 26 pages. If you're a municipality of 2,500 or even 5,000, do you have the capacity to enforce everything in that code? Uh, so the point is you want to make sure that uh, you have 
particularly a property maintenance code that you can enforce. You have a comfort level in enforcing that. It's not too much for you to uh, administer. And uh, finally, as I've mentioned, uh, I think a right-sized approach looks at some other potential options, including a rental housing licensing ordinance. Again, Andrew mentioned that. Uh, the ticketing ordinance encumbering personal and real estate assets for costs incurred in, uh, by municipalities in obtaining compliance. So the ticketing ordinance I'm going to be able to go through pretty quickly. And, and what you're doing here, as Andrew mentioned, and Ed got into this, is you're essentially this is your precursor to issuing a code citation. You're giving somebody a warning. And I suggest uh, the warning be uh, in writing. In other words, I wouldn't issue a ticket right away. I would give them a warning letter. And then I would issue the ticket if they don't take care of that particular issue within so many days. Uh, but the point is, in terms of compliance, with a couple exceptions, uh, the, the vast majority of municipalities uh, that I've worked with are saying they're getting those code issues resolved at that ticketing stage. And the beauty of that is, Harold, I think, got into this a little bit, is uh, you spend a lot of time issuing code citations and a lot more time appearing before the magisterial district justice. If you can get 80 to 90 percent of those issues resolved at the ticketing stage, isn't that cost efficient? And I'm telling you, municipalities in Pennsylvania, that's what they're telling me, with a couple exceptions. 80 to 90 percent of those issues, they're getting resolved at the ticketing stage. The nice thing about uh, ticketing uh, is that it is, a, uh, it is essentially a fine. It's a penalty. So if they don't take care of the problem, uh, they would pay a fine, let's say, of $25. If you want to issue subsequent tickets, you can do that. Second ticket, $50. Third ticket. Uh, $75, and then, uh, then you would have to issue uh, the code citation. But those fines come to the municipal government really to use as you please, because they're fines and they're not fees. Okay? They're penalties, they're fees. They could be used to bolster the code enforcement effort or for other general government purposes, but the point is that's an additional source of revenue for you. Again, because we have uh, talked about ticketing, I'm not going to get into the details in my PowerPoint here because I want to talk about some of the other things. I will tell you, though, that those 10 percent that are the hardcore people that are your problem properties, they're not going to pay the ticket. Let's, let's have a reality check up front here. They're not going to pay the ticket. But you know what this allows you to do is focus Focus your efforts on those people rather than to focus on what, all 1,000 people that got tickets in Coal Township in 2012. Typical provisions in a uh, ticketing ordinance. Again, I won't go through this in the interest of time. I will tell you that uh, Teresa uh, has your email addresses. I've given her a sample ticketing ordinance, and I think the intention is to send that out to everybody who attended and actually Everything I'm going to talk about in my presentation, you'll be getting uh, a sample ordinance if, if you want one, uh, not just the ticketing ordinance. In a minute, I'm going to talk about a property maintenance light code. But the point is you can see what provisions are in that sample ticketing ordinance. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious uh, why it makes sense. Uh, the, uh, in the case of the ticketing ordinance, uh, basically it reduces the administrative burden. Again, if you can get the vast majority of those issues resolved at the ticketing stage and actually collect a few fines. And just to give you another example, a small borough in McKean County, Kane Borough, um, I think it was the year before last, the borough manager told me they collected $800 in fines from ticketing. All right, doesn't sound like a lot of money, but it's $800 they didn't have in their municipal budget before. And he's saying he's getting 90% compliance at the ticketing stage. So. Tool number one that you would want to consider if you're a smaller municipality or rural, uh, ticketing. Tool number two, a light property maintenance code. Um, we talked about the international property maintenance code. That's 26 pages long. Great code, don't get me wrong. But it's, it's a lot for a municipality of 2,500 or 5,000 to enforce all of the provisions in that. So the solicitor in McKean County and I worked up what we call a light version of a property maintenance code that is uh, six pages, 
five pages long rather than 20, uh, 26 pages, uh, requires less technical background to enforce. Uh, and in theory, staff should be able to enforce this ordinance more easily. Now, it still provides at the end of the day, if somebody isn't complying, you're still issuing a code citation. But the point is it focuses on the big stuff. International property maintenance code covers a lot of, lot of ground. This light version of the property maintenance code covers the big stuff. And again, this is a sample ordinance that we can get to you. Just to give you an idea, uh, the International Property Maintenance Code covers historic structures, uh, covers swimming pools and hot tubs, covers insect screens, plumbing, mechanical. The light version of the Property Maintenance Code that I developed in conjunction with a solicitor up in McKean County focuses on, again, the big stuff. Uh, buildings and structures, yards and open spaces, garbage and rubbish, infestation, uh, drainage, uh, abandoned vehicles. So again, it's focusing on the big stuff, building maintenance with regard to safety, cleanliness, and security, maintaining buildings free from deterioration, capable, uh, incapable of supporting loads. Are they in danger of collapse? Uh, calls for the removal of uh, buildings where they're deemed hazardous by the municipal governing body. Are they health and safety issues? gets into other issues as well. I don't want to mislead you. Uh, deals with uh, foundation walls, uh, the condition of the roof, overhang extensions, are they properly anchored? Exterior stairways, are they properly anchored or in danger of collapse? Chimneys, again, in danger of collapse, properly anchored. Those sorts of big items that you'd want to focus on if you're into code compliance. So, Light version of the property maintenance code as an alternative to the international property maintenance code. The third that um, most of you have in place, it's called the fire insurance escrow, but there are 23 municipalities in Carbon County. Only 15 of you have implemented this, and a couple boroughs have not implemented this. So listen up if this doesn't sound familiar. This is, again, the fire insurance uh, ordinance. This provides a source of funds, essentially insurance proceeds, for the municipality to ensure that the property owner and municipality can take corrective action following a fire when the loss exceeds 60% of the limits of liability. Uh, and again, prevents a fire damaged property from affecting property values in the area because of uncertainty. Essentially, th this makes sense because if you don't have this in place, if you have not enacted this ordinance, uh, a owner of real estate that has, where there's been a major fire, could take those insurance proceeds and not repair the property and not demolish the property, and it becomes your problem to deal with it. The whole idea of the fire insurance escrow law is you pass an ordinance that says that you're going to participate essentially in this program. That ordinance says, again, when the, the law exceeds 60 percent of the value of the property, that the insurance company is going to pay you, the municipality, $2,000 for every $15,000 of loss. So for a $60,000 loss, the insurance company is going to send you $15,000 that you hold basically as leverage to make sure that the owner takes care of the problem, either demolishes the property or repairs the property. So this is a way to have leverage with those folks. And it also, there's a provision that when the claim exceeds $7,500, uh, the municipality may be reimbursed for expenses relating to securing, repairing, or removing property, or for unpaid assessments and taxes. So there's no good reason that you wouldn't want to do this, regardless of the size of your municipality. Now, the key is you need to pass the ordinance. You send your ordinance to the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development. There's a website that the insurance companies look at when they're about to pay a loss out. And uh, that website lists all the municipalities in any county that have enacted this. If your municipality hasn't enacted this, in fact, you want to get on that DCD website. It's the fire insurance escrow law, Pennsylvania fire insurance escrow law. If your community has not enacted this, it won't appear on that list. The insurance company will pay all of the proceeds to the owner 
you won't have anything as leverage to get what you need, which is for the owner to take care of the problem. Now, if the owner doesn't take care of the problem, then at least you have some money to demolish the property. Okay, so that's the whole idea of the fire insurance escrow law. Asset encumbrance ordinance. You've heard uh, reference to Act 90 of uh, 2010 a couple times today. And this provision in Act 90 of 2010, to the extent that you incur costs when the owner fails to take care of a problem. In other words, you've gone, you've gotten an adjudication at the Magisterial District Justice. The Justice has imposed uh, fines and uh, ruled against the owner, but the owner doesn't do anything. And it gets to the point where you have to uh, deal with the problem. You either have to demolish the property or you have to repair the property. Uh, this allows you not only to put a lien against that property, but any other properties owned by that individual in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So if there's a property in Lehighton and that uh, particular property owner did not take care of the problem and because of health and safety issues, the municipality took care of the problem. And we're not talking about cutting grass. We're talking about serious violations, serious violations. If they don't take care of the problem and your municipality has to deal with it because it is a, self, a health and safety issue, again, you can put the lien against that property, any other properties they own in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And let's assume that owner in Lehighton also owns properties in Schuylkill County or Northampton County. Those properties can be liened as well. That's the leverage that you're looking for because you're encumbering uh, their real estate, not just real estate in Lehighton, and it can, you could even encumber, in theory, their personal residence. So you'll get their attention pretty quickly. So again, I won't go through this in the interest of time. We're, go we're gonna be emailing this out to you. There are sections of the act that are uh, referenced here, the, the citation for the asset encumbrance ordinance. But the point is, um, if you don't have some of these ordinances, you really ought to consider them as a smaller municipality uh, because your ability to uh, address code violations. Uh, I mean, you're on the front line. Uh, while the state has great resources and the county can be helpful, uh, you're on the front line. Uh, you're in the trenches and you have to make sure that you have ordinances that will work for your municipality, again, that are right-sized for your municipality. So let me just uh, talk a little bit about land banks. Where does a land bank fit into this picture? Uh, land banks are public bodies under Pennsylvania law. Legislation authorizing the formation of land banks was passed in late 2012. There are now uh, 20 land banks in Pennsylvania. Most are land banks formed by counties, but it is possible to have municipalities, a consortium of municipalities form a land bank if the county's not interested in forming a land bank. And that's how Schuylkill County's land bank was formed back in 2016. Uh, land bank is particularly well suited to address the problem of blighted and abandoned properties. Here's why. There are three primary characteristics of blighted and abandoned properties. The property has liens against it, taxes, utilities, municipal, other liens that exceed the value of the property. These are characteristics of blighted properties. Eventually, uh, people stop paying taxes and stop taking care of the property and there are liens against it. The property is uh, tax delinquent and has been purchased by speculators at real estate sales. And this happens, you see a cycle of abandonment where uh, at tax sales, particularly when you get to the judicial sale and sometimes uh, the speculators are purchasing properties out of the repository so they're so cheap. And then final characteristic of blighted and abandoned properties is the property has title issues. And land banks are really uniquely qualified to deal with these three issues. Uh, first, in the case of the property having liens against it, land banks are helpful in resolving this issue because they can negotiate waiver of liens that exceed the fair market value of the property of the land bank would acquire the property. In other words, uh, land banks when they come into existence, they enter into agreements with the uh, taxing authorities 
and municipalities that authorizes them to, uh, with the permission of those taxing authorities, to basically reduce the amount of liens below the fair market value of the property. Is if those liens exceed the fair market value of the property, for all intents and purposes, the property is dead in the water. Why would someone buy that property and redevelop that property if the acquisition value exceeds, uh, the acquisition value is less than uh, the total liens against the property? That's why a lot of properties just sit and sit and sit for many years. Uh, in the case of tax delinquent properties, Land banks can be helpful in keeping speculators from purchased delinquent properties by acquiring properties using its pri priority bid powers at tax sales. One of the unique aspects of the Pennsylvania law is uh, the ability of land banks to uh, be the priority bidder at judicial sales with the permission of the County Tax Claim Bureau. What does that mean? Uh, that means that the land bank can be the only bidder for that property. Okay, now the land bank does not want to buy every judicial sale property, don't get me wrong, but there are some properties that may be of strategic interest to municipalities. In fact, if a land bank was formed in Carbon County, what I would suggest is that municipalities provide the land bank with a list of properties that from their standpoint are strategically located that uh, need to be acquired with the idea that they can be repurposed and put back on the tax rolls. So the point is, the land bank can be the priority bidder for those properties. No one else can bid against the land bank if it indicates to the Tax Claim Bureau that it wants to bid in that property, okay? Now, one of the things I hear a lot, uh, well, somewhat, I don't hear it a lot, somewhat is, well, aren't you getting in the way of people that wanna do good things in your community who are bidding in properties at judicial sales? And the answer is no, because what you want to do is have a relationship with those people that have a good track record of doing the right thing in your community. And you basically uh, want to have an agreement with them that if you move ahead and buy this property, that you will be basically be the conduit for acquiring that property for them. And that allows them not to bid against a speculator, so they can get that property at the cheapest price and not have to bid against a speculator. So everybody wins. Everybody wins. And then finally, uh, when a property has title issues, and again, the unfortunate reality is a lot of these properties, blighted properties, do have title issues. There was a lien that wasn't satisfied. Uh, there could be an estate that was never open. Uh, land banks have uh, the authority under state law to initiate uh, expedited quiet title actions and get a ruling from the court within 120 days. So land banks are ideally suited to uh, deal with these characteristics of blighted properties. Bottom line, uh, land bank can be useful in getting control of blighted properties, so the blight can be remedied and the property is redeveloped for productive use consistent with local needs. Uh, so I know, I don't know if there's been discussion about a land bank here in, in Carbon County. The closest there is, uh, Monroe County is uh, moving ahead uh, with a land bank. Uh, Lackawanna County uh, has a land bank. Um, trying to think, uh, Northumberland County, Schuylkill County have land banks. Um, I'm sure anyone uh, from those counties would be happy to speak with you about uh, the value they're realizing for land banks. But there are 20 in Pennsylvania, and uh, they're doing good work. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. It's a lot of information, so we will be here for a lot of questions. I want to introduce Kathy Henderson uh, from the Carbon County Chamber and Economic Development Corporation. They are our sponsor uh, for lunch, and she's going to say a few words. And then uh, everybody wants to grab a sandwich, grab some lunch, and we'll come back and do the question and answer at that point. So um, I'm sure a lot of folks have questions or, or comments to make. Uh, so, Kathy? Thanks, Doyle. I don't have a PowerPoint, so we need the lights. I need to see my notes. I won't remember what I want to say. Thanks, Doyle, for having the Chamber uh, partner with you on this, on this important topic. We really appreciate it. Um, I also want to thank our county commissioners. I see Tom and, and uh, Wayne here today. Thank you to you guys and to Bill, who couldn't make it, 
for your uh, assistance and partnerships and everything that you help us with at the chamber every day. And uh, Senator Argel, thank you for SB 76. Keep it going. We're waiting for it. <laughs> I can do that. I will do that. Um, so a lot of people ask me, so what is it that you do every day? What is your job? And I always tell them, well, my job is economic development. And they look at me like, what is that? Sometimes I don't know myself. But most of the time, my job is extremely important. So in 2013, the Chamber and Economic Development Office, which was a part of county government, merged and created Carbon Chamber and Economic Development Corporation. Uh, and that, uh, in 2014, I was hired, along with Marlon uh, Kistner, to um, come into the Chamber and Economic Development. And then Alice followed us closely. And we worked together as a team to bring economic vitality to the county. So I would say that the Chamber side, which is Alice and Marlon's side, is the uh, fun side, because they are always planning our networking events and working with members and, and out there among the public and having a good time. And my side of the office is more the serious one, and uh, we do all the heavy lifting. So that's, that's just a joke in our office, because they work as hard, or if not harder, than I do. So basically, I, I work with local and state governments to create a business-friendly environment, and with developers and businesses to find the best locations and programs to help them grow. So we partner with the Wilkes University Small, to business, Small business Development Center, the SBDC, uh, and they work with both, both new entrepreneurs and existing businesses to help them uh, grow more and to um, help them find programs that they might be needing to help uh, with anything that they need in their business. So we also administrate loan programs in our office. So I'm certified to underwrite PETA loans um, for industrial, Pennsylvania Industrial Development Authority. Uh, these loans are used to help businesses finance construction projects, purchase real estate, machinery and equipment, and also offer lines of credit. And then I must take class. I, I have to still go back to school because every year I have to be recertified for PETA loans. So that means I have to sit through finance classes and uh, uh, pass them and get my credits so that I can be recertified. So we've been doing that. Uh, loan amounts in these programs range from several thousand to several million dollars. So these are the larger loan programs that we can offer businesses and uh, local areas to help them with their projects. So I also administrate the uh, Carbon County Industrial Development Authority. So what we do in that capacity is I underwrite our own in-house loan programs, of which we have three. We have a small business expansion loan fund, uh, money that was given to us or uh, contributed to us by the county to administrate. We have a new entrepreneur loan program that is meant just for brand new entrepreneurs who have never been in business before. They have to sit through their and pass their first step program with the SBDC. And then uh, we also have our IDA revolving loan fund program. So all of these programs are low interest loans. Right now they're at three and a half percent and we go out from se five to seven year terms. Right now we have over $570,000 worth of loans out into the community and helping small businesses to grow and prosper. So last year, the good news is, more good news is, that CCEDC was able to hold ribbon cuttings for 22 new businesses in Carbon County last year alone. Uh, and we are looking forward to another record-breaking year this year. So the current projects that I'm working on, I'm working on quite a few projects. Um, some of them I'm not able to discuss in public right now because they're still in the planning stages, but they will be very, very exciting when they do come around. Uh, but the current projects are Dollar General. I work with the developer of Dollar General stores to look for locations in Carbon County. We just secured one in East Penn Township, uh, working on a few others. Um, and the LERTA program, Andrew, you had spoken about that, and I have a question for you on that later. Uh, but we are uh, looking at that program. It has not been done in Carbon County. It's been done in our surrounding counties, but it's not something that any of our municipalities and local taxing bodies have taken advantage of. So we're working on that right now. Um, also looking on 
looking at working for creating co-working space and business incubators. That's a, a hot topic right now in a lot of municipalities and communities. So um, I'm working on two different locations for the possibility of putting in a co-working space and business incubators uh, and also working with the FBLAs and uh, in our schools and the DECA program in our, in our tech school, which I'm proud to say our tech school is the best one in the state. Um, also working on two different warehousing and distribution projects in the northern part of our county. Um, Main Street Lee Heighton project, thank you Nicole for all your help on that one. Um, we're working very close to getting started on putting that all together and boots to ground so we can get Lee Heighton going again as well. Jim Thorpe parking and traffic study, I was on the steering committee for that so that final report should be due it in May sometime so we'll be able to uh, take advantage of a grant that was received from NEPA uh, and uh, see what we can, what kind of answers that we have to our problems in parking and traffic in Jim Thorpe. Um, so I also facilitate the business education partnership at the chamber. This group is structured to work with our businesses and educators to help them coordinate classes and teach the skills that are needed when the kids enter the workforce. We also administrate the CCEDC scholarship fund, so that's for graduating seniors in our high schools in Carbon County that are going into the business uh, curriculum once they uh, graduate high school. Uh, but the business education partnership, some of our businesses and manufacturers that are members of that partnership have come to me and said that there are students that come out even if they just come right out of high school or even college, don't have the basic skills necessary in the workforce. They can learn everything that they need to learn to get their degree, but they don't have the soft skills that are required to be successful in the workforce. So uh, that's one of the things that we're working on helping to solve that problem. Uh, but also, I have a manufacturer that initiates or, or gives a test to potential employees that come to his business, and they simply you know, simple questions on there. One of them is reading a ruler. They can't read a ruler. And this is a problem. So, um, you know, not to mention the drug problem and if they pass a drug test. Um, soft skills, of course, we all understand that. They don't know how to make eye contact. They have a problem holding a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so these are issues that we're working at in, in our organization as well. So just to list, I'm almost done. We're, I, I know I'm the only one that stands between you and lunch, so I'm almost there. Um, so I also sit on NEPA board, uh, and Paul McNosky was with NEPA, and that's where we first met. Uh, so that's Northeast PA Alliance, and they're based in Pittston. Uh, we're made up of seven counties, from Schuylkill up to Pike County, Luzerne, Lackawanna, Monroe, Pike, Wayne, Carbon, Schuylkill. I think I got them all. Um, and then I'm also on the board of uh, CTC Manufacturing, which is Carbon Training Center, and they're based in Beaver Meadows. They work with, um, our, a percentage of our employees are um, mentally and physically challenged, and so we provide work for them, meaningful work for them, and the ability to earn an actual paycheck and give them pride in being able to help support themselves. Um, so I'm also a member of the uh, Pennsylvania Economic Development Association, and I sit on their public policy and professional standards committees, so I keep track of these guys here, what they do in Harrisburg pretty closely. Uh, and I'm also on the steering committee for the Carbon Schuylkill STEM ecosystem, Main Street Lehigh and Steering Committee, uh, Greater Lehigh Valley Chamber Public Policy, which is another very, very strong uh, committee. Um, Carbon Chamber and Economic Development is under the umbrella or a, a partner with the Greater Lehigh Valley Chamber, which encompasses 5,000 members and is the largest chamber in the state of Pennsylvania, seventh largest in the country. So we are very, very proud to partner with them. Uh, and I'm the vice chair of the NEPA MPO, which is Metropolitan Planning Organization. You know, I've been here in my position for five years, and I think I'm finally getting all these acronyms down. I'm just, you know, there's and Lehigh Canal Recreation Commission. So we take care of the, the canal trail in Weisport, uh, but not only Weisport, but as it stretches from Jim Thorpe all the way down to Lehigh Gap at the Nature Center. So I, I do have free time every once in a while, so I just, I, I'm committee chair for my, uh, boy, our Boy Scout troop in our church. So uh, Boy Scouts, if you have anybody who is interested, 
Troop 82 in Lee Heighton is recruiting, and it's an awesome program, so I would recommend it to anyone. Um, that's basically what I do in my day. So people look at me and wonder how I get time to do anything else, and I really don't. That's why I'm taking off four days this weekend. So, um, Rick, I will not have my cell phone on me. It's going to be turned off. <laughs> so, uh, and I thank you very much for all coming today. If you have any questions or concerns or have any businesses that are looking to open or need some assistance, you know where the chamber is. We're in Lehighton. And um, Alice is waving at me from the back of the room. I want to remind you about our uh, Main Street Lehigh Valley grant program. Uh, she has applications back there. And like Marlon said, uh, that fund has contributed over 20, 30,000, 30, do I hear 40? 30,000 dollars to uh, municipalities in Carbon County. Uh, and you can see some of those benefits if you go into Lansford, that sign welcoming them you into Lansford. Uh, flower pots and things in, in Lehigh and self-watering planters in Lehigh and so there's a lot of benefits in that so see Alice if you would like an application and um, thank you everyone for coming again and have a great day and a happy Easter <laughs>